Buenos días, eh, buenas tardes. Gracias por unirse el día de hoy a nuestra última sesión del good curso. Morning, good afternoon. Thank you for joining our session today. We're going to talk about air quality in the air. And uh, we are going to use simultaneous translation today. So feel free to use the button on the uh, button of the screen. As I was saying, this is going to be the last session we have. We already had five previous sessions. This has been organized by the organization, a uh, world uh, meteorological organization, also the atmosphere institution and the Latin American institution for global change. And also we have a great host, the global consortium on climate and health education. We would like to remind you that this session has, we have a section for questions and answers here. Also, we're going to share the information about this workshop in the website so you can have access to it later. Also, remember that at the course website, you will be able to find the presentations in the other language if you could, uh, if you needed it. Great. You can see that in the chat, we're sharing with you some recommendations in the short term to face climate change and El Nino. Remember that to have the certification for this course, you must have at least attended four of the six live Zoom sessions and earn a score of at least 70% on the final exam. We will register your presence automatically when you join the sessions. Also, this evening, we're going to send you the electronic exam and you will have 24 hours to complete it. No more than that. Tomorrow, at New York time, the exam session will end at 12 p.m. We are joined today by Juan Jose Castillo. He specializes in intensive care. Sorry, Juan Jose Castillo is a regional advisor on air quality and health, Pan American Health Organization. He's a regional air quality advisor of the Pan American Health Organization. He works at delivering technical cooperation to health officers in the Americas and in the Caribbean to capacities towards addressing the air pollution burden of disease. He has worked for 12 years in the environmental public health field and has worked as an executive director in international nonprofit organizations, faculty and researcher, and as a public officer in transport, environment, and health. He has working experience in the private sector. Also, we're joined by William Checkley, who specializes in intensive care medicine. He's an expert in the diagnosis and management of acute respiratory failure and the acute respiratory distress syndrome. He also has extensive experience in the management of other life-threatening conditions commonly seen in medical intensive care unit. He is an MD from Northwestern University and received his PhD from John Hopkins University. He also has training in pulmonary and critical care medicine at John Hopkins School of Medicine. His research interests include international lung health, epidemiology, mechanical ventilation, and acute lung injury. Also, Dr. Checkley 
has been recognized by the National Institute of Health with the 2007 Postdoctoral National Research Service Award and the 2009 Pathway to Independence Career Award. Thank you so much for joining us today. And I think we're giving the floor to Juan Jose. Is that correct? Yes. Thank you very much, Irene and everyone for your participation. I'm very happy to join this session and uh, we celebrate your consistency attending to these sessions. I am Juan Jose Castillo and it's a pleasure for me to join you for this session. And we're going to talk about air quality. I would like to cover topics such as air pollution and health, how climate events affect air quality. Also, how these meteorological aspects can exacerbate current conditions and what we can do about that. As you can see on the screen, before we start, here we have a survey on menti.com. There you can have access to the QR code. You can go to your browser and use the code 42901420. And also you have in the chat access to go into menti.com with the code that I just mentioned. Great. We have some people have joined us. Uh, we see some people have joined us. So the first question is, what are the main sources of pollution in the air, according to you. So we have as responses, human activity, burning fossil fuels, transportation, garbage, transportation industries, garbage, carbon dioxide, industries, garbage, I'm interested to see if uh, there is a, a word that uh, gets bigger, but no, that's, I'm trying not to influence on you. I'm sorry, Juan Jose, please don't change language so that uh, our interpretation stays smooth. Okay, so now if we think about the effects on health by air pollution, So the, some of the aspects are cancer. That's the, uh, those are the answers to the question. What are the health effects of air pollution? I have great participation from you. I'm not going to bias anything. Those are some of the effects that are associated to air pollution. And they're very evident. We will see how that is connected to the presentation. Okay, so here we have uh, breathing problems, cancer, allergies, asthma. Great. And in the last question, 
do you think is is air quality improving worldwide Thank you. We're going to try to answer to some of those questions throughout the presentation. Once again, thank you to all our partners who have joined this session. It will be a pleasure to do this session. As I was saying, this session is focused on air quality. And in the next slide, I have uh, the content of this presentation, air pollution and health, how climate events affect air quality, and also the PAHOS response. I would like to start with this note from the, double, uh, the World Health Organization stating that billions of people still breathe in healthy air. It says that almost 99% of the population live in areas that exceed WHO air quality limits. However, it's also worth highlighting that this is small data that only has included five, 6,000 cities in 170 countries that are now monitoring air quality. Normally in cities, there is air quality monitoring, but when the city has 500,000 inhabitants, they authorities do not have air quality monitoring. Also, air pollution is a global issue and around 7 million deaths are linked to air pollution worldwide. This is an image from the World Health Organization. And as you can see, the red areas mean higher pollution, as you can see, it's mostly, mainly concentrated on Africa and Southeast Asia. But as you can see, in South America, there are also regions that have high levels of pollution. And this is something that I would like to highlight. Air quality is a common challenge for all Latin America. And this is something that we have to solve. It uh, is linked to 370,000 deaths. Also, air pollution is the main environmental risk to health in the Americas. Maybe you have heard about that in previous sessions, but there are indicators that uh, that is the case. And also, it not only has an impact on health, but also it is linked to the economic development of the region. And the externalities costs reach 2 to 4% of the GDP in the uh, countries in that are developing. So you have uh, that loss of productivity that affects the GDP in 2 to 4 percent. Additionally, more than 250 million people in Latin America especially, as I said, Latin America live in cities that don't have information about air quality. So maybe those numbers are underestimating the actual situation. 
Now, what are the main pollutants? We're talking about atmospheric pollutants. So we have particulate matter that have two fractions, the PM 2.5 and PM 10. That is the uh, part of the particles, particles that can be inhaled. And those particles travel in the air and they can be uh, get inside of our lungs. The PM 2.5 go up down to our lungs and PM 10 are a bit more superficial. And then we have as other pollutants, nitrogen dioxide. That is a con pollutant related to gas, natural gas, or coming from oil. So nitrogen dioxide also affects our lung function. Also, we have ground level ozone. This one is a very powerful oxidant agent that affects our breathing. It actually sometimes is used to purify water because of its oxidant capacity. But if we inhale that, it affects our lungs. We also have sulfur dioxide that is more connected to carbon, to charcoal and diesel. That is why, for example, when we're talking about transport pollution, this uh, type of activity can generate particulate matter that includes sulfur dioxide and also carbon monoxide. And also we have lead that not long ago was a component in fuel. So here we have an image that can uh, give you a more, a better reference. And here we can see which are the main sources of pollution. As you can see, we have different sources. It depends on whether it is an urban or rural area. And for example, you can have the industries. It depends on how the setting of the city is, but sometimes these areas can be located in highly dense, uh, with highly dense population, or sometimes they can be far from urban centers. In both cases, they're going to have contaminate uh, pollution problems. Because of dispersion, the, um, can, the pollution can affect in large areas in the population. And so we also have transportation, which we also have um, a lot of challenges here in our region. And when it comes to transportation, um, a lot of vehicles that are increasing. And so this is another really important factor because um, we're using a lot of old um, vehicles and bad practices and catalytic converters and um, preventative. We don't, we don't always have the right kind of maintenance on our vehicles. And so this really from transportation ends up causing a lot of air pollution. Other actions um, like we have here, um, household energy um, where we use, you know, um, firewood and um, gas. And so here we also have air pollution and this generates atmospheric pollution and which causes a dual problem because we have 
um, people are directly exposed to this within their homes, but also this pollution also affects uh, the environment. Mm, agricultural practices like farming, but would, for example, slash and burn, which um, generates a large amount of air pollution. There's also dust that's um, brought up from um, farming. Also waste management. So for example, when we burn um, the waste that causes air pollution and that has uh, climatic effects as well. We've got dust, which is another factor, which can be suspended both in highways, on streets, um, because of the contact that tires have with the pavement, or maybe the roads aren't um, paved. And so that also causes dust and also because of erosion around cities that generates um, this dust suspended in the air. We also have um, pollutants that cross borders. So we can, we're, we're gonna find, you know, pollution, for example, in the Sahara. And here, it's not on the, on the screen here, but we can see, um, you know, fires, forest fires like we've seen in Canada and other regions, which is also a major problem that we have when it comes to air pollution. So pretty much all of our organs are affected. And so this is something that's really important because usually we talk about air pollution and we think about, you know, respiratory diseases. But what we can also see here is that, you know, cardiovascular diseases are also related with, related to um, air pollution. And there's a whole series of impacts on health that we've been identifying that would include like arrhythmia, and you can see skin aging, and decreased birth weight, uh, premature births, and you can see diabetes. There's a growing um, problem that we see when it comes to health, when, you know, cancer. And so what we can see is that air pollution here really does affect us a lot. It's like taking a glass of water, polluted water. And if you can take, um, a, a, you can drink a glass of polluted water, but water pollution is something that um, is, you know, air is polluted the way it is, we breathe it in. And of course, this is um, a pollution that we see, you know, a lot of things that are going on and we have different substances, but we really need to make an effort to try to reduce the emissions of air pollution pollutants. So when we look at air pollution burden of disease in the Americas, what we find is that there's four or five main effects on the health. And one are strokes, uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, lower respiratory infections, a cancer, a lung cancer, and also ischemic heart disease. And the causes of mortality in the burden of disease and that come from air pollution. So we've got 7 million um, deaths that come from this. In addition, air pollution is the second leading cause of death from non-communicable diseases. And so this is something that's really important because uh, recently air pollution was just recently included in risk factors for non-transmissionable diseases, non-communicable diseases. And so it's not, this is just a, not just an environmental health issue or, you know, environmentalists, but this is, you know, more of a health, a public health problem, which should be um, dealt with just like tobacco use, alcohol use, unhealthy diet, physical inactivity, and air pollution is just another one there. And so we really need to make, make it a priority. It's the fact that pollution doesn't mean the same thing to everyone. And so we're talking about 7 million deaths, but through the course of our lives, there are different conditions that put us in higher levels of vulnerability when it comes to air pollution. So for example, children, 
pregnant women and uh, the elderly are all people who have who are more vulnerable when we talk about air pollution because of their um, course of life and so you know um the development of lung development in children and how air pollution can affect um, the elderly people. But there's also conditions, life conditions, in which people are more exposed to air pollution. So for example, in this picture here, you can see a home where they're using firewood for cooking. And so as you can see here, there is a lot of smoke and most of these people we can see are women and children and elderly that are inside of the home for a longer amount of time and they're exposed to these pollutants so there's um so here we see one risk on top of another so we see people who have um lower levels of income are the ones that are using these pollutants and these are people who, because of their life situations, they're more vulnerable and there's like inequality because these are people who in these contexts, um, women are the ones that take care of the home, etc. So here we can see people who have higher exposition, higher exposure to air pollution um, are people who spend a lot of time in traffic. Um, and so they have, they have a higher expo exposure to air pollution. So air pollution affects us all, but it doesn't affect us all to the same extent. And so here are, you can see the different levels of air pollution and you can see um, the differences. So the recommendation that we have of the World Health Organization is that there should be five, um, that five that there should not be any more than five above um, as the amount of air pollution that can be in the air. So if we look at because of um, specific, we see that there's a high level of particles, which is a big problem around the world. And so just to give an idea, there's certain countries that are much closer to the recommended concentrations. So you can see up here, these are um, countries that like, you know, like Canada, uh, but there's other countries that are in the same region that have really high concentrations of pollutants. So here, if we talk about, we can see that air pollution levels tend to be higher in cities. So here we can see a graph where we can see Central America is in the dark land, South America is gray, and the Caribbean is blue. And in the cities, particularly in uh, Central America and in the Caribbean, we see that they have higher concentrations than in rural areas. You can see that this also, and we can see that this is a weighted average. And so um, clearly this is, this is weighted to show where you have higher levels of population. On, a, on the positive note, we can see that in the Amer region of Americas, we can also see that air pollution is decreasing and so is the mortality rate. So we see this positive um, association. And so this is something that can be modified over time and effectively as part of the responses to the initial questions, air pollution has been consistently reducing in most of the sub regions of um, Latin America and the Caribbean. So over the last few years, um, while we're still very far away from the um, WHO recommendations, in a general terms, we are seeing uh, um, a trend downward. So now, of course, there are some phenomena which are happening. And so one thing that we're seeing is that these large if phenomena, like for example, dust in the Sahara or in other, you know, um, forest fires that we've seen this year and that we're going to see um, are going to be happening. Are, we're going to see an increase in the amount of um, forest fires because of climate change. And so as we see these peaks of air pollution 
is going to give them much higher visibility and we're going to be have an increased um, visibility and in monitoring of air pollution and air quality because before we didn't know just how bad it was. So now we have more visibility of this information. So in this context, the World Health Organization has set up some guidelines for um, air quality and there's objectives for reducing, um, for, for improving air quality. And these objectives include personal goals so that we can um, reach, so that we can reach the recommended um, AQG levels. So this is really important because it's not just about having some sort of rule that says this is the rule and it has to be there, but rather have an entire, you know, continuous improvement process that's gonna make it possible for us to transform. And so you can see that the sources are um, polluting energy, transportation, so that we can better plan our cities and have um, better energy, better uh, control systems so that the, the um, sources of emission are reduced and we get to um, better air quality levels. So if we look at the AQGs, we see that the average, and here we see it's five, five micrograms. And in the region, we're at 32, which is what we saw in the previous slide. And um, this is really important. And we, you can also check out this information. And so, so we can understand why we see some of these um, diseases that have been happening within our, within the different populations. And the idea is that we can all take action. So we see three types of recommendations. Reference levels to have um, maximum health protection, intermediate uh, protection levels, where we go from one to four, from, and that's gonna help us to achieve the air quality um, goals. And we also have good practices. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about these different um, good practice suggestions. So we've talked here about sand and dust storms, um, black and elemental carbon and ultrafine particles. So as you can see, the sand and dust storms are related to um, climatic phenomenon, which can be affected by um, El Nino, and um, we can see also these ultrafine particles. These are from particulate material that are even, that are smaller than one microgram, and that can and get into your bloodstream. And also black carbon is um, a climatic effect between air pollution and um, climate change. And so this could be the opportunity to have a, this joint action to improve water, um, air pollution, and, and also uh, climate change, which is really powerful. So now, how does El Nino affect air quality? So here we have several articles. Um, in the press about the El Nino. Um, here's something that comes from the NASA and their NASA. And so we can see how we can have record levels of air pollution, that El Nino is related to more forest fires in Indonesia, uh, dust pollution in China, um, affected by different spatial and temporal types of El Nino, and the contribution of local emissions and um, transboundary air pollution to air quality in Hong Kong during the El Nino Southern Oscillation and heat waves. So El Nino, we're gonna talk a little bit more about this and we're gonna see um, as two factors that influence air quality. So air quality is um, related to emissions, the source of pollution, but also due to meteorological conditions. So temperature, meteorology, precipitation, how all of these issues affect air quality. So topography, other types of transboundary air pollution. So we can think about a concept that we call um, atmospheric basins. 
which is a, basically when we think about that water quality is something that does move around the world, but they also have um, certain specific patterns in the territory where we have um, cycles, air cycles or air bodies where they collect emissions and then those um, can exacerbate air pollution. And so when there are low atmospheric stability and the air is not even moving, that is when the water is, the air is trapped. And that's when we have, um, the, the contaminants have nowhere to go. And so that's when we see higher levels of air pollution. But something that's really important is that we can see as there's an increase in temperature and different um, types of chemicals in the air end up creating ozone. And so when we have these heat waves, so as you can see here, we can see in different areas of the city or in the territory, there's different temperatures. And so in urban centers, in the middle of the cities, we're gonna have higher temperatures because we've got a lot of buildings, we don't have a lot of green areas, a lot of asphalt. And so what this causes is an accumulation of heat. And there with this higher levels of temperature, we can see a generation of pollutants like ozone and also for secondary particulate matter. And those um, particulates are, um, can tend to agglomerate uh, to, um, into particulate matter. And so while meteorology is important when it comes to air pollution, El Nino can definitely affect water air quality. And so it's just something that we can see when we are related to air pollution in extreme P, which is a lethal combination for breathing in Texas, as you can see here. And um, here's another article that we see which comes from Mexico City, where they say is an ambient, is an environmental contingency coming. And they talk about a heat wave in, in Mexico City because of the formation of ozone. So here, this is from October 23rd. Um, this is something that we see that's happening where we have air pollution due to forest fires in Bolivia, which are all phenomenons, which are related to El Nino, like um, greater forest fires and droughts that affect air quality or heat waves can affect um, air pollution and air pollution um, is increased because of this. So here, let's look at this here where we see dust in the Sahara, where we see the relationship between the Sahara and the Nino. It's not very clear yet, but you can see that um, this is something that we're seeing something that's happening um, that starts in the this is this type of pollution that we see that's moving from Africa into um, South America. And so here we can see the different sensors, which we have in San Vicente in the Grenadines and in Barbados, which is related to a volcanic eruption. And we can see how those sensors cause an increase in concentrations um, on the 2nd and 3rd of October. And that is related to this movement that we can see here in the um, satellites with dust in the Sahara, which is throughout the entire region. And so these are all phenomenons that can be affected by, by these types of situations. As we should have them identified to prevent health issues. Let me just remind you that you have a couple minutes left. All right. So what are we doing at PAHO? We believe that PAHO's response is not only to not leave anyone behind, but also to work in partnership with the entire population in terms of health, climate change. This is a good opportunity to reduce air pollution and mitigate climate change together. And also we believe that the solutions should look at the sources, meaning we should improve transportation, better management of trash, having more green cities, 
cleaner transportation, also access to cleaner energy. So as you can see, this is an intersector effort that requires everyone's participation. Additionally, the health sector has a crucial role here by raising awareness of the impact of air quality on health, advising the public and patients about how the impact of air pollutants can be mitigated at an individual level, also gathering evidence on health effects from air pollution, and also joining advocacy efforts at the national and international levels to ensure that the health arguments are heard. And of course, engagement of the entire health community. The PAHOS air quality program has several aspects, for example, environmental air quality, home air quality, health establishment. Also, we work on regulation and governance, planning and evaluation, surveillance and information systems, and some recommendations to address the impacts of El Nino on air quality. And they include investing on early warning systems and surveillance systems also to improve emergency response and strengthen healthcare service delivery, as well as research capacity building and communication, as, long as, as well as intersector collaboration. We have four tools at PAHO, such as AirQ+, Climate QH, Green UR, Heat, and they are aimed at government authorities, decision makers, and stakeholders who wish to adopt them in order to improve air quality and protect public health. And to wrap up, I'm talking about key messages, air pollution is a large health risk, but is modifiable as a risk factor. Also, exposure to air pollution carries an important inequity aspect. There is evidence of regional progress, but further ambition is required. We want to reach the 2030 agenda goals, but also we believe that integrated health, climate and air quality action is key to success and also that global phenomena can exacerbate air pollution. And this is a multi stakeholder effort and the health sector needs to be involved. Thank you very much for your time and thank you for inviting me to talk in this session. Thank you, Juan Jose. We're gathering the audience's questions so we can choose of the most frequent ones. So we'll now give the floor to Willem Checkley. Thank you. I'm going to share my screen. Thank you, Irene, for that introduction. I'm willing to check me. I'm a doctor. I'm also an epidemiologist. I am a pneumologist and I work in intensive care, but I also have been working in global health, mainly interested in the effects of environmental exposures on health. I'm going to focus on the specific topic today, and I would like to talk about a practical case in Peru that in some of our research in terms of climate variability and the effects of weather variability on human health. For those who do not speak Spanish, we have simultaneous interpretation and we also have the PowerPoint presentation in English available to you. So you can use it to follow these uh, presentation. Well, I work at the Global NCD. It's a Center for Non-Communicable Disease Research and Training. We call it global entity in short. And we work in several parts of the world in Peru, for example, and our mission is to conduct high quality research and training for the prevention and control of non-communicable diseases. 
in low and middle income countries. We also build local capacity through partnerships with international institutions and communities. Here we have photos of our team in Lima. We work in the southern area of Lima City, Pampa San Juan, of Flores, and here we see photos of our research team working in the field in Peru. So the objectives of this talk are to summarize findings from our studies on extreme weather variability and human health in Peru. The focus is not going to be on environmental air quality, but rather on other specific results such as diarrhea and growth. We're going to talk about the 1997-1998 El Niño episode that was one of the most serious episodes we have had in the Peruvian coast in the last decades. This photo is just to remind you what the Niño, El Niño is. We call it a Southern Oscillation. It's predominantly resulting from a change in the movement of warm water coming from the Western Pacific to the South American coast. And this happens because there are winds that lose their strength and they allow for this movement of warm water to the South American coast. In general, there are strong winds that keep the warm water in the Western Pacific, but when there are trade winds, they lose strength and therefore there is movement of warm water coming from the western pacific that warms up all the ocean towards the latin american coast including peru and this warming water results in environment temperature increase that results in climate and meteorologic and different um, results. And we had the chance to analyze the 97-98 El Nino effects and its uh, correlation to diarrhea in some oral rehabilitation centers in Lutma, Peru. This oral rehabilitation center is one of the main hospitals of Lima, the National Child Institute, Instituto Nacional del Niño, and it has an oral hydration center, and it had uh, faced challenges at that time. And at that time, we could gather some data on that topic. As you can see on that slide, this is information that we have gathered about daily activity in this oral rehabilitation center. And it traces back to 1998. We gathered the temperature information from Senami, which is a government institution that gathers meteorological information. We gathered information from their monitors that are scattered around the city 
and the diarrhea admissions information was gathered with the National Child Institute with Dr. Figueroa Quintanilla, who helped our team work along with the statistics team to gather this daily diarrhea admissions information. So this helped us create the relation between significant warming in ambient temperature and diarrhea admissions. So you could see that as the temperature increases, there are higher numbers of admissions of diarrhea patients. Something that I would like to highlight here is that here we see three different panels. The first one is diarrhea's admissions of diarrhea patients. They can go from zero to 80. And then the next panels are about the daily average temperature. And then we have the mean humidity levels. If we look at temperature, we can see that in general, the temperature follows a seasonal pattern with higher temperatures in January, February, March, April. That is uh, during the Peruvian summer. Then it declines during the winter season in Peru. You can see that that seasonality is also correlated to the number of diarrhea admissions. As the temperature increases, there are more diarrhea admissions. Now, when El Nino happened in 1997 and 1998, it was a long El Nino. In 1997, we saw a drastic change in the seasonality in terms of temperature and relative humidity. And that also was related to the diarrhea admissions. You can see that that seasonality fades and there is an increase in numbers. So there we could use analytical methods for timelines to help us find the connections between temperature increase and diarrhea admissions. And most important, El Nino in 1997-98 had severe results or effects in meteorology. The purpose was to determine the excessive temperature that goes beyond the seasonal average and how that is related to diarrhea admissions. Here we see an analysis of the effects of El Nino in temperature, ambient temperature, in why we have the average temperature and in axis X, we have the time in calendar days, meaning when the El Nino started in 97 until November 98. And the line with the great shade shows us the mean and we see a confidence interval of 95%. If the Nino hadn't happened, that would have been the seasonality that would have been seen in Lima temperature. But here you see some crosses, and that is what was 
noted. And we can see that the temperature is significantly higher than what was expected if El Niño had not happened. We used our time series, and for that we created a harmonious method to capture information about temperature seasonality, and then we could have estimates of temperature uh, if El Niño had not happened. And we could show, put this into graphs and then make a comparison with the observed temperature during El Niño and what would have happened if El Niño had not occurred. And in the other panel, we make a calculation of what is observed, contrasted with what happened and with that was uh, expected. So I would say that what is most significant here is what happened in the winter. Something that we observed while we were doing this analysis was that the El Niño episode in 97, 98 made the winter become summer. The same happened for the same methodology was used for diarrhea admissions. We made estimations we, as you can see, the line with a gray shade is what would have happened if El Niño had not occurred and the crosses are was what was observed. So there we could do a correlation and there we see that there was an increase in diarrhea admissions compared to other times or what would have happened if El Niño had not occurred. So there we see that there is an average increase of almost 50%. And in the winter months, there was an increase of 100%. Of course, there were days when the increase was not that significant in some specific days. And then as we had that information, we could look at what was observed, what was expected, and then we could determine based on what we could see Beyond the variability, the seasonal variability of temperature, what do we do with this graph? In this graph, we look at increased diarrhea due to excess temperature rather than seasonal variation. In axis X, we looked at an algorithmic scale Before El Niño, there was not excessive temperature, and that didn't lead to higher diarrhea cases. However, when El Niño arrived, this excessive increase of temperature is what was really, um, was really, was really making it happen. And so when we talk about the importance of extreme events, this um, affects um, human, human and what happens with human demand. And so here, um, we had the opportunity to also look at um, specific pathogens at the... So as you can see here, this is in Lima. They had an epidemic that was a really severe cholera epidemic in 1992, which took three, four years to get um, under control. And that's when we thought it had been under control and this, this cholera. But then when El Nino came in in 1998, we started to see that, um, we started seeing cholera coming about in the cities 
And so this is when we had another opportunity to examine this increase in temperature because of El Nino and how that was related to related to cases of cholera, seeing that excessive temperatures, which was caused by El Nino, ended up with being associated with that increase of cholera cases. And where in 1996, 1997, we didn't see cases anymore. And then all of a sudden there was like this huge increase in cases in January of 1998. And that was um, part of the study that we had uh, created a surveillance network to detect um, outbreaks of cholera in the cities. And um, we had gone to several different um, and sewage lines in Lima, and we were doing, um, we were sampling the water in several areas and um, throughout the network to be able to identify if we were going to be able to find um, specific uh, cholera contaminants, gluten. And so these are um, viruses that um, are, are closely related to cholera. And so if there were an increase in um, case of cholera in the city, and um, it would, we would see in the sewage systems, there would also be an increase in these biophytes. And um, with this, uh, the presence of these, um, these microorganisms would mean a way, something to promote, that that would be a, a, you know, a risk factor there. So we could find this increase in the sewers in these um, small particles we could find those would we would see that three or four weeks before cholera cases would would reach a, a peak levels and it also had to do with this increase in environmental temperature and so that is when we talk about um a hospital admissions related to diarrhea which is related to cholera and so we also had the opportunity that when we were, and we also had the luck, we were doing a longitudinal study of uh, children's health, and we were doing surveillance of diarrhea. Um, we had one cut off um, in, in a child, a two-year-old child, and another, uh, no, a different cohort. One at two years, another one of 12 years of age in a peri-urban area of Mira Flores, and we were going to people's homes um, daily and to see what was going on. And what we found was that the incidences of diarrhea increased nearly 55% during the El Nino phenomenon in comparison to um, times that happened before the Nino. And which was, we indicated that using different longitudinal analysis to be able to compare the period that was before um, the Nino and then um, in 1997-1998. And what we found was that the increase in the risk of diarrhea during the spring was very similar to several age groups of children of children who were under 12 months of age, you know, infants, um, it was nearly 1.7. And then we saw children below um, the age of seven where they had uh, nearly double the risk of diarrhea. And so in these um, cohorts, we were also evaluating hetero enteropathogenic parasites um, where we could see this crispiridium and Zygospora, and what we found was that there was a major increase in the findings of enteropathogens during the El Nino, um, especially these two. So during that work that was done, we found that there was a connection between the 1997-1998 El Nino, both in the hospital as well as in the community which, um, you know, you think about the the hospital or references to um, and a severe cases. And in the community, we were thinking that these were reports of diarrhea that were related to serious cases 
which um, maybe they don't need the hospital um, service, but they are still it's a large burden of diseases because of just the, the sheer number. So what we found was that the pathogenic burden that was affected was cholera, cryptosporidium, and cyclospora. And this led us to believe that the Nino could be a natural model for studying the effects of um, extreme climate variability as it relates to health. So I just want to tell you that your time is up. So if we could just finish up. I just have, if I could have finished just two or three minutes, I, that would be great. I just wanted to talk about this other study that we did in Northern Peru, where, well, we do have the effects of El Nino in Lima, especially in Tumbes much more affected. And so we made several qualitative um, interviews in Tumbes. And what we found was that a lot of people had very vivid memories of what had happened in 1998 as far as losses, having to move, floods. And so we said we should do a retrospective uh, study and put together a cohort, a retrospective cohort, cohort in 2008-2009, we looked at uh, over 2,000 children of um, children that were born and in, in, that were born in 1991 and 2001. And so what we did was we looked at the different um, height for age score. And we did that study throughout the area of the Tumbes River with several um, local communities. And so also a precipitation. And what we could see here in 1997, 1998, a major impact on meteorological variables and, you know, oceanic temperature, maximum, minimum, and so here we have the opportunity uh, with biostatistical um, information, also atmospheric information to be able to create a hydrological simulation and the land service model of propensity um, of flooding during the El Nino. And here you can see in 3D where the river is located. And this is the red areas where all the communities are located where we work. And here we could see that there was a significant increase in floods in several different communities. And we also um, looked at economic information. So there was a huge drop in the production of plantain and rice in Tumbes during the El Nino of 1997-1998. So not just crop loss, but also of the risk of uh, food insecurity during that time. And so we made an analysis here to relate the effect of El Nino from 1997 and 1998 and the height of children based on their year of birth. And so what we could see was that during the observation time that between 1997, there was an increase, an annual increase in the height for age score, but with children that were born in 1997-1998, that inc annual increase was, was, was interrupted and there was actually a drop, which um, suggests that the El Nino had interrupted um, the improvement we had seen in nutrition in Tumbes. And there we saw that we could see how we were going back to the way things had been previously. 
And so the other thing was that we were able to find that there were um, losses in, in growth in children who lived in homes with a high level of propensity to flooding. And this is something that we use um, propensity scores, and which was greater than 7%. And so we saw that then there was a major loss in the height um, score. And so um, children that were born after the El Nino had less lean mass, while um, while fatty, um, fatty tissue increased. And so we saw that uh, children that were born during the El Nino, like a very severe case, which was in 1997, 1998, had really severe and lasting effects. And so we have to think about, given the cyclical nature of El Ciclo, of El Nino, that this could continue negatively affecting future generations. And so I just wanted to um, express my appreciation for all the people that participated in our research. So thank you very much. And I'm sorry that I went over time. All right, well, thank you. I'm, I'm sorry, because that was actually really interesting. But we did want to um, leave a few questions for a, a little bit of time for Q&A at the end. And so um, we can go now to the questions. There are several questions. We can't answer all of them. For Juan Jose, there was a question of a patient with respiratory disease. How oh, to hospitals or health centers, how can they in, improve um, air quality in those places? It's for Juan Jose. I don't know if he's still here. Yes, yes, yes. So it's good to recognize that there's risk and that air pollution does affect people's health. And so um, we have to have a surveillance system that is going to be monitoring uh, air quality information and related to um, health recommendations. And also, you know, pre preparing um, first aid um, situations to be able to deal with that, these um, air pollution ma uh, matters. And so there's two times, when are we talking about air pollution? We're talking about what's going on like in Bolivia and something that um, has happened in Honduras and also in Canada. And so what we're hoping, what we're seeing is that there's gonna be like a peak of um, respiratory diseases. And so at that point, we should have some sort of a quick response system. But also when we're talking about patients, we have people who have um, part of their diagnosis we can identify that um, with, for example, in their home, they could have contamination or pollution, or whether they're using, um, you know, coal or firewood for cooking. And so this is something that could be affecting people. So we have to always take that into account. And I also would want to respond. Um, another thing that was in the chat, which talked about uh, how we communicate information. We think that we can have newsletters and when it comes to air quality, to help us understand how people are being affected and to um, use the guidelines of the World Health Organization, as well as to possibly um, air quality indices. So for example, here we can see some data. Um, these are uh, this is from Barbados. These are the different monitoring points that we can see the D, the concentrations of hondos are um, related to air quality amounts and um, and that, that helps us to, to look at each case. All right, cool, thank you. Uh, and now for Dr. Checkley, what preventative measures are recommended to people to avoid diarrhea? So we understand there's a correlation that you've got the figures We've got um, potential to produce early alerts and in um, health sectors and as such when you don't have and when you don't have the, the surveillance that's happening, what can what do you say to patients? Well, first of all, there's two things that we have to look at here. One is 
extreme events like El Nino. Today, we can have a, you know, we can predict um, that the El Nino phenomenon is coming six months before it happens. And so this is one thing where our um, governments, both nationally, regionally, can increase their messaging when it comes to preventative um, messages when it comes to avoid um, diarrhea. And so, you know, this would be, it has to do with hygiene, water quality, and um, um, things that have to do with, that, with water and sanitation and how to avoid the transmission of diarrhea. And so at that on the one hand, and then another thing would be that knowing and following the information in the um, ENSO influx, I could say that our um, government can have, um, can increase their, um, these newsletters and this, in, this information. When it comes to messaging, I think something that's really important and what was, you know, we want to avoid is mortality, obviously. And so we need to have more information about the use of um, oral rehydration at home and um, to be able to say where the oral rehydration um, centers are is a local level to help children who are um, very dehydrated. And then obviously using that space and time to give uh, notifications and messages that have to do with public health for to prevent diarrhea like in general. Thank you so much. Okay, another question that I have for um, Juan Jose is, is there, is there a list or a ranking um, some way for for countries, like especially in Central America, but other countries in the region, know where they have the highest levels of air pollution so that the health centers, health districts can have enough information to be able to um, produce those messages and recommendations for people. So I had a had a little connection problem. I didn't hear half of your question. Yeah, what I was saying is there's some sort of ranking, some sort of list, a map of the countries, the areas, the cities um, that have higher level, higher incidence of air pollution that um, so that health um, departments or health centers so that they can be alert and to know what measures, what measures need to be um, taken to protect the population. So this is um, work that's been um, together between the health sector, the environmental sector, so that they can coordinate to really, um, you know, take on these, these matters. And so there's going to be and um, there's different ways in which um, the we can, we can report this data when they're talking about concentrations of air quality and indices. And so recommendations that there should be management plans, integrated management plans um, have to do with um, health and also climate change. And so that we can see how those episodes um, in the different seasons or because of like the, the menu that can, can be mapped out and so there can be coordination with environmental authorities there. And so we do have uh, some little databases when we talk about database in the World Health Organization and also the air quality association that we have around the entire world, which has a comp an air a, a more historic um, information. It's also online platforms that show what that, that countries are doing monitoring and that they're reporting online. And uh, the truth is that um, I saw a question in the chat about the QA about how the community. Sorry, regarding the question in the chat, it's uh, important to look at what's happening at the local level because maybe the community has sources of information for more advocacy. At PAHO, we support the country's processes in different areas because we know there are different sources of uh, pollution and different sources of management. Also, if I could add to that, we could look at the level of availability of information. 
regarding air quality. And we see that in Latin America, there is a gap. It is important to work not only with local governments, but also with multi-sector groups to improve the number of monitors of air quality. At least in Peru, we have noticed that there are what we call departments that do not have monitors. We were working with Cayetana Heredia University and with other colleagues from Universidad de Mori through a program funded by the National Institutional Health of the US to install low budget monitors in all the departments of Peru. And we're working on that at the moment. But it also requires us to have referential monitors because low budget monitors help us understand patterns. They also have to be gauged with a reference monitor. They have, there's, it entails a whole setting. So I highlight the importance of having more reference monitors to better understand the evolution of climate and air quality and act upon it. And as researchers, our task is also to advocate so that there is a good network of quality research. As I mentioned, there's the availability of these low budget monitors and satellite information, but we always need referential monitors to improve the quality of the information. Thank you so much. Very interesting. Also, the fact that you highlight citizen science is uh, great. We also work in citizen science in our institution. We have one question for Dr. Checkley. You were doing the climate and uh, disease analysis. Maybe did you include socioeconomic data? Am I frozen? No, it, it works fine. Dr. Checkley image froze. Well, I can talk about the air perspective. Sure. In our slides, we included the figures of 2 to 4 percent of the GDP because of externalities of air pollution. And how would do the estimate of that? This is based on work that we did in Colombia looking at the impacts and the benefits of mitigating climate change. And we gather information about diseases. And we looked at statistical data. Of course, there are other economic costs that were not included, but we saw that there was a step forward from environmental data to health data as well. So we also included socioeconomic aspects and that was uh, that provided us with a wider perspective and back. I'm going to ask the question again for you. The question is, besides the climate and infectious disease data, you have included socioeconomic data. That's a great question. We do not have social demographic information or displacement information. That information is not available to us at the moment. There are some institutions that are, that are gathering that information, but it's not readily available to us. We usually work with the people themselves, 
with, and we have a census of 100,000 people in the Lima area and around 40, 60,000 people in Uno area. That's what we do with population studies, whether it is for conservation or field trials. So we still work on paper somehow. We gather information in that method. Of course, yeah, there is, it is impossible to do everything, right? Maybe if, as we are wrapping up, maybe if you want to share any pajos or a link or about the research in Peru. The slides that you have presented have also shown us some pieces of research that are available online. We're very grateful to our attendants our participants for their very active participation and for their great interest. Remember that the exam is going to be available from now midnight New York time until tomorrow. And you need to take that exam within those 24 hours because we don't have more deadlines. The certificates will be issued in a week. Thank you very much to interp our interpreters for today and who have joined us throughout the course. Thanks to their work, our different audiences have had access to these presentations. Thank you to the presenters for today, Juan Jose Castillo, William Checkley, for their generosity in sharing their knowledge and their experience with us. Uh, the work they do in their different institutions. I don't know if Haley from the consortium, you would like to say something. Thank you very much for joining us throughout this week's uh, for this course. Do you want to take the floor, Haley? Oh, you're putting me a bit on the spot here, but I think you covered pretty much everything. Um, thank you to all of the presenters who shared their expertise with us throughout the entire series and to all of the participants for their um engagement through this entire course and um we'll be in touch with what's next because this is not the end and muchísimas gracias Haley Campbell ha sido la persona encargada de organizarnos Haley Campbell has been the person in charge of organizing everything and thank you for that we have also uh, some other Pajo members but they left the session thank you everyone thank you and see you soon